Well, hey, if I haven't met you before, uh, my name is Brian. I'm on staff here at Lake Springs. Um, and uh, my wife and I, we've been living in North Carolina since about 2016. But before that, we are from Michigan, uh, from the Detroit area. And one of the biggest differences that I've noticed since moving down here versus up there is in, in Michigan and specifically in that area, we have a big um, car culture there. We, it's, it's the Motor City. So we, we like our cars. We like old cars and muscle cars. And when I came down here, it's not that, you know, I know some people here actually have really cool old cars, but it's not as big of a thing as it was up north. Um, in fact, just a couple weeks ago, we had Spring Fest down here in Holly Springs, which was very cool. It, it was huge and great, but they advertised that there was a car show. And if you were one of the cars in that, the cars were great. The cars were very cool. But there was like 10 cars. Like, this isn't really a car show. This is like a parking lot. But <laughs> it, up north, we have, we have like these massive car shows. We have what's called the Woodward Dream Cruise, which is uh, Woodward is a road that leads into Detroit. And every year, thousands and thousands of old cars cruise this road. And it's for days on end. And you can go and camp out and watch it. And uh, so that's what I grew up in. And that's what I always loved. I always loved cars. And I always wanted an old car, but could never afford an old car or had the time to get one. But... Um, what I always wanted to do with my life is work on cars. And so after high school, that's what I went to college for. I went to college to be an auto mechanic and got a job at a shop right out of school. And one of the things that I learned very quickly that was a deficiency of mine is I did not know how to drive a stick. Now, when someone hands you the keys to their car and you have to go pull it in the shop and you look inside and see that it's a stick shift and you realize, I, I, can't, do I can't do anything with this. And you got to go get one of the other guys, which I was the youngest guy in the shop, and guys are mean, and so I get ridiculed constantly for it. And so after a while, I was like, this is, I, we got to solve this problem. And so the best way I could figure to solve it was just to buy a car that was a stick shift, sell my other car, and then it's like, I either learn this or I can't go to work. So I went out and got this Camaro. It was a 98 Camaro, and it was awesome. It was, there's a ton of things wrong with it. It wasn't in good shape, but it was very cool. And so I took my dad with me, we went to go buy it, and afterwards we went to a park to, so he could show me how to drive it. And it, it was relatively simple. Like I knew the mechanics of it, I just didn't want to test it out on someone else's car. So he drove around there for a while, it was fine, and then went to drive home. And he was like, you want to drive it home and I'll follow, you be, follow behind you. So I said, great. So we drove home. And the way I took home is um, there's this road by, by my parents' house that is just this massively steep hill that goes up and right at the peak of the hill is a stop sign. And so it's like worst case scenario for me. And I don't even think about it until I'm halfway up the, or not even halfway up the hill, but like starting to go up the hill that, oh no, this is a terrible decision. And there's nothing to do about it from here. Because it's not like there's a, a stop light where you get a handful of cars going through at a time. It's just inching up the hill. And so I'm trying to figure out how to do this without stalling out. And I'm stalling out left and right. I'm trying to get my foot from the brake, my other foot's on the clutch, trying to get it to the gas and, and, and rev up fast enough. And I'm going backwards into my dad and trying to get up and just stalling out all over the place. And to where eventually my, my dad gets out of his car, puts it in park, comes up, and he's like, you want to switch so we can get home? I'm like, that's fine. <laughs> and, uh, and then the car behind him, a guy gets out of that, and he's like, do you guys need help pushing? Is, is the car broken down? And my dad's just like, now it's like, no, 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 he's just learned how to drive a stick. We're fine. <laughs> and, uh, so, and, and so we, we get out and switch, and as I'm going back to his car, I look down, and there is a line of cars stretching into the abyss, just forever of cars waiting for me to the point where people are actually out of their car, walking around, talking to each other, like, do you know what's going on up there? Is everyone okay? I was so frustrated and mad, and we get home, and I'm just, I'm mad at my dad for taking us that way, which I didn't even think about until I was thinking about this story for this message. Um, I grew up in that house, and this park was about five minutes from home, and I was the one in front, so I controlled where we went. I could have taken a dozen different ways to go home, but I chose that way, but still blamed him for it. And like, think, I, I, I just think about how often do we do that with God? It's like we make all of our own decisions. We get ourselves in a situation, and then it's like, God, how could you do this to me? How could you put me here? How did you do this to me? But that's where we were, and it was, it was, it was tough. But I eventually figured it out, and it was fine. But what I realized is that I, I understood some of what to do. I understood the mechanics. I had some knowledge. But I didn't understand the whole picture. I didn't, once, once that knowledge came to put it into practice, and once I was faced with a difficult situation, I realized I didn't have enough knowledge to actually get me where I needed to go. And so today we're going to be looking at a, a story as we continue our study through the book of Mark um, about the, the disciples and Jesus and an interaction they have. 
And we're going to see that even though they were close to him and had knowledge of him, obviously, when, when kind of put in a difficult situation, we realize that they didn't really understand the full scope of who Jesus was. Uh, so if you have a Bible with you, go ahead and open up. We're going to be in Mark chapter 6. Um, as, and if you haven't been with us the past handful of weeks, just to let you know kind of what we're doing, is we have decided to take the main text of what we're studying off the screens. And the reason for that is we really want to encourage you guys and encourage us to open a physical Bible together. We really care about biblical literacy. We want to dig into the text ourselves. And so we have uh, blue Bibles scattered throughout the room. And the page number for those blue Bibles are on the screen. And we also have these uh, black scripture journals for the book of Mark that are also throughout the room. And the page number for those are on the screen as well. And hey, if you don't have a Bible or don't have one of these scripture journals, please take one home today. That is, that is our gift to you. Uh, but we're, that's where we're going to be today. We're going to be in Mark chapter 6, starting in verse 45. And what's happening here is this is coming right on the heels of Jesus feeding the 5,000, which is the, the, the last story we looked at last week. And so that happens, and we're coming right on the heels of that, and we pick up in verse 45. And it says this. Immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up to the mountain to pray. So the very first word of the section, it says, Immediately. Immediately something happened. And, and this week, uh, Derek, and Derek came into my office and he was looking at kind of the, the, my notes for the week and kind of realized that, man, Mark says immediately a lot in this book. It's, like, it's almost like an action movie. Like, one thing happens, the next, and immediately they move, then immediately this, which is great. I think it's a really good gospel to study because there's, it, it, it's like there's no extra. It's just everything is just happens and happens and happens. And it's, it makes it kind of easy to follow along. But in this case, we look, it says, immediately he made his disciples get in the boat and go to the other side, and then he dismissed the crowd. So we kind of can ask the question, why does he do this? Why is, right, right when we're done there, he's kind of sending them away, sending the crowds away, what's actually going on here? And we don't really get a good idea of that in the book of Mark. But if we look to John, the book of John, we get a little bit more of a picture of what's happening here and why he's doing the things that he's doing. So in John chapter 6, these verses will be on the screen. Starting in verse 14, this is right after the feeding of the 5,000. It says that when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. So this gives us a little bit better of an idea of what's going on here. See, there's a, there's a the, the, in the Old Testament, the prophets prophesied about a coming Messiah, but there's this idea that this Messiah that was coming was going to be more of like a warrior Messiah that was coming to overthrow Roman rule. And this would have been, honestly, the perfect time for Jesus to do this, if that was his mission. And this is what people were thinking, because what just happened is he had just fed 5,000 men, and this is right before Passover. And so at Passover, what happens is people make a, a pilgrimage into Jerusalem for Passover. And so what he essentially could have just done is he basically just recruited 5,000 men onto his side with this miracle, could have led them into Jerusalem under the, the guise of the pilgrimage for Passover, and then infiltrated the Roman government kind of from the inside and over, overthrew them. And so this is what people were hoping was going to happen, that they wanted to happen. And so Jesus is he's dismissing them. He's sending his disciples away. He's withdrawing himself, and he's trying to make it clear that this is not why I came. This is not what we're doing here. And it says Jesus leaves the people to be alone with God. And we continue in verse 47. When evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of night, he came to them, walking on the sea. He meant to pass them by. So this says this took place uh, in the, the fourth watch, and that, that's, that's between 3 to 6 a.m., so Jesus came to them walking on the sea. Now, if you've, if you've spent a lot of time in church, or if you're new to church, you've probably heard some reference before to Jesus walking on the water. It's probably the most well-known thing that he's done, even if you've never opened the Bible before, just in pop culture references, you've probably heard something about Jesus walking on water. And so it can be easy to look at this story and um, kind of almost tune it out because we've heard it so many times. So I want to encourage you as, as much as humanly possible to try and look at it with fresh eyes to see not, not what different, I don't have anything different that you're gonna, probably going to understand today than you have before, but just what we can learn a from who Jesus is and what he's doing here. See, I, I, I like to think about it like this. We, um, my wife and I were foster parents, and when we took in our first foster child, about 2018, I think it was, uh, he was a 10-year-old boy, and he was the most energetic child I have ever seen in my life. 
not like hyper energetic, just had so much energy. He could just go and go and go and never get tired. I remember when we first met him, we would go over to the house that he was staying at and, and hang out with him and meet him and take him to school before our license was activated. And so we got to know him a little bit. And the first day we met him, we took him to a field by their house to play soccer because we learned that he liked soccer. And I grew up playing soccer. So I was like, I'm okay at it. It's like, all right, this is going to be great. We can, we can play together. He's going to respect me a little bit and like that I know what I'm doing. And we're playing, and it's like 90 degrees, and we're playing for hours. And I'm just like, this is going to kill me. I don't, I cannot keep up. I go to my wife at one point to get just a drink of water, and I'm trying to look like I got it all together, and I'm just dripping sweat, and I'm like, we got to figure out something else to do here. He's having a blast, but this is, is, this is going to end me. We need to go to McDonald's or something from here. But we, he always liked to do stuff like that. He was really active, and so when he was living with us, he really wanted to go mountain biking. So we did that a few times just around our house, but he had heard that Umstead Park has really good mountain biking trails. So we made a plan. We got some bikes. We were gonna, I was going to take him to go mountain biking. And it was, we were going on a Sunday evening, and we had planned it all week, and he was really excited about it. He told his friends he was going. It was going to be great. And so we go, and we get there, and we pull off the road, and the gates are shut. And what I realized is this must have been like winter hours or something. I looked online at their hours, and they're supposed to be open, but it was shut, and he was so bummed. He was so sad to the point where he started to cry, and not in like a tantrum way, but he was just like genuinely sad that this was this thing that we, he had looked forward to. And I was bummed because I had promised him that we would do this, and I couldn't think of anywhere else we could go that we could do this at because it was getting late. And so I was just trying to think of what to do, and I look back in the rearview mirror, and I see that he has his hand, head in his hands, which means he's not looking out the window. And I look at the gate, and it doesn't really stretch across the whole road. And I look back at him, and he's looking down, and I look at the gate, and I see like the shoulder is pretty clear. And so I just like drive around the gate and drive in. And start driving, and I'm just like, we're, I don't know what's going to happen here, but we're getting in. And it, I look back, and he, he looks up, and he starts looking around. He's like, where are we? What happened? And I, in my infinite dad wisdom, just lied straight to his face. So I was just like, they just let us in. It was, they, they closed it on accidents, and it's not time to close yet. So they just let, it in and, uh, let us in, and it was great. And uh, it was a teachable moment for both of us, it turns out. Because we, uh, we, go, we go mountain biking, it was, it was fun, everything was great. We get back to the car, and there is a, uh, like a park ranger waiting at the car for us, because we were the only car left. I'm like, hey, sorry, and she was asking what we're doing there. <laughs> and, yeah, we're mountain biking and stuff, and she's like, well, you got about like two minutes to leave, because I'm already past when I was supposed to go home, and uh, when I lock the gates, you're going to be sleeping here tonight. Like, okay, we're, we'll get out of here, we'll go. But at the end of the day, there was no reason for us to be where we were. There was no, no good explanation for us to be where we were. And this is what we see with Jesus as he's walking to them uh, in, on, the, on the water, walking to them at the boat. That there's no logical reason for him to be where he is. There's no good explanation that they could have come up with to explain why Jesus was where he was. Except that Jesus must have been something different. And that's what we see here, is that Jesus does what only God can do. Jesus does what only God can do. He's not... Um, just, he, he's not just kind of performing another miracle. He's not just doing something like that. He's doing something that it was understood that only God could do. Only God could tame the seas. Then it says, he meant to pass them by, which is, if you're reading this for the first time, that's a weird thing to say. Why, is he, why do he mean to pass them by? Why didn't he mean to rescue them or to go out to help them? Why would he mean to pass them by? And, and I want to say before we dig into what that means, if, if you come across a question in Scripture, Oftentimes, the answer is also in Scripture. Oftentimes, if we, if we look to other places, we can kind of get answers to the questions that we have, and that's the case here. And what, what, we, what we see and what we know is that this idea of God passing some, someone by is something that happens multiple times in the Old Testament. In Exodus 33, Moses asks God to show him his glory, and he basically tells him, if you were to see my glory, you would not be able to live through it, but I will cover your face and pass by you and then uncover your face so you can see me from behind. In, in 1 Kings 19, God passes by Elijah on Mount Horeb, and not in a, a strong wind, an earthquake, or a fire, but in a gentle whisper. See, Jesus, again, what he's doing is he's doing what only God does. He's, he's passing by them to reveal himself to them, not to just show up and fix the problem. And what he's doing is he's kind of answering the question here that we saw the, the disciples ask just a couple chapters ago in a very similar situation where they were on the boats, they were on the sea, Jesus was asleep, and the winds and the waves were crashing around, and they wake him up, and Jesus calms them, calms the winds and the sea, 
And at the end of it, they ask, who is this then that even the wind and the sea obey him? So what he's doing is he's, he's answering this question. He's showing that he is able to do what only God can do. By walking on the sea, he's showing that he is in control, that he can tame the sea, something that was understood, that was the power that only God had. If we continue reading in verse 49, we see kind of their response a little bit to it. It says, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost. They cried out, for, all, uh, for they all saw him and were terrified. Now, this isn't just they, they saw something and, and it was a shadow and they thought, this is creepy, this is a ghost. But wh- th- th- there's this belief that if, if, this, if a spirit or a, a kind of a, a ghost in the way we would think of it, but if a spirit were to approach at night, that it would bring disaster. So it wasn't just that the winds were tossing them around and, and they saw something creepy on the sea and they weren't sure what it was. It was, oh no, we, 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 we know what this is and we know what this means. This is going to mean that this is going to end poorly for us. We continue, and it says, But immediately he spoke to him and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. See, there was, there was winds and waves and on the sea. It's, it's, it's pretty unlikely that they would just recognize Jesus' voice. So why does he say, it is I? Why doesn't he say, it's Jesus? It's me, it's Jesus, your buddy, we're good. But he doesn't. He says, it is I, don't be afraid. You know, I, I, a handful of years ago, we threw my older brother a surprise party, and we went to his house to kind of plan at me and a few of his friends and wait for him to get home. And as we're waiting for him to get home, I realized I had to go get something from my car. So I opened his front door, which right in front of his front door is his driveway. And right when I open it, headlights shine right on me. They pull right into the house. I'm like, well, this is ruined. And I had no reason to be there. He wasn't expecting me. And so I go inside and tell everyone, well, sorry, it, it, the surprise is ruined. He just saw me, so... You can hide, but we don't need to put much thought into it. And um, so I just kind of crouched down in his kitchen. He had a hallway that led to the kitchen on the right, so I just kind of like sat on the ground waiting for him to come in, and we turned the lights off. And he comes in, and he walks in, he goes into his kitchen, and he just locks eyes with me. And it's, it's like dark, dark. And so he just sees this figure on the ground. And so he freezes. And for some reason, I also freeze, because I think, why isn't he saying anything? And so we just stare at each other for a minute as he kind of slowly backs up a little bit, presumably to get something to, like, end me, to, to protect his family or something. And so eventually, like, it's, it's your brother, it's, it's me, don't, don't worry, and it was, it was all fine. But if he saw me and saw this thing, he didn't know what it was, and especially if there was a bunch of commotion around and I just said, it's me, don't be afraid. <laughs> He'd probably be more afraid. And so why is Jesus saying just, it is I? It, 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 don't be afraid. What, what's, what's this mean here? See, again, we can look to the Old Testament and things that God does to see an answer here. In the Old Testament, God is referred to as Yahweh, which literally means I am. In fact, in Exodus chapter 3, God is talking to Moses through the burning bush, and he says this in Exodus 3.13. It says, Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Now when Jesus says, it is I, the Greek phrase he's using here is is ego iemi. And what that literally means is I am. So we see that Jesus isn't just saying, it's me, don't worry about it, it's me. But he's, he's, he's referring to himself, he's identifying himself in a way that God uses to identify himself as well. So we can see that not only is he doing what God does, what God can do, but he is ident- he's using God's name to identify himself to the disciples. Then as we wrap up this, this first section of the story, we continue in verse 51 to see what happens next. It says, And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. And they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. Um, see, this is a, 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 such a common and well-known story that it's easy for us to uh, forget how incredibly unbelievable this would have been for the disciples. This was not just another miracle like they had just seen. In fact, one, one commentator writes, he said that the, the disciples would have had no category to understand the presence of Jesus on the boat. It's not just like, this is amazing. It's, this would not compute. This makes no logical sense for Jesus to be where we, where we just were, and then Jesus appears, and now he's on the boat. This, this does not make any sense. This would not make any sense to them. 
And you see, Mark's gospel has a tendency to highlight how much the disciples don't understand. We see that a lot, and it seems like we can read it and get the sense of, like, why don't they get it by now? He just did his miracles. He just did these things. Why don't, why don't they get it? I get it. Why don't they get it? This, they were walking with him, and they knew him better than anybody. And that's a good question. And I want to be clear, there are no bad questions when it comes to Scripture. As you're reading it and something odd pops up, the best thing you can do, or the worst thing you can do is not ask. The best thing you can do is just to have a conversation with somebody, try and figure this out. But the reality is when we have thoughts like that of how could the disciples not have understood? I think the, I, 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 I don't think that the issue isn't that the, the disciples didn't understand. I think the bigger issue is that we don't really understand Jesus' power. It's that we are looking at it from our modern lens in the way that we think we understand things and because we've heard it so many times and we can look back and say, well, I don't think they get it. This may, it's, 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 it's cool, it's amazing, but you don't understand what's going on here. But when we do that, I think we're, we're underestimating and diminishing God and the power and how awesome what he's doing is here. And we see is after Jesus calms the storm, we pick up with the second part of the story starting at the end of uh, Mark chapter 6, starting in verse 53. It says, When they had crossed over, they came to the land at Gennesaret and and moored to the shore. When they got out of the boats, the people immediately recognized him. They ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he came, in villages, cities, or countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplace and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment, and as many as who touched it were healed." So they, they, they didn't land in Bethsaida, as was their plan. It seems like the, the winds kind of blew them off course, and they landed a little bit southwest of where they were headed. But it says that the people immediately recognized him, which, which completely contrasts the disciples just previously, who didn't recognize, who didn't know, understand who he was, and didn't recognize him. It says people were coming from all over, running from all over, just to touch the hem of his garment. And this obviously is a, is a reference back to just a few chapters ago, or just, just a chapter ago in chapter 5, where we saw the, the, the bleeding woman just touch the, the hem of Jesus' garment and was healed. So people were running from all over just to, just to be healed. And, you know, sometimes it's easy to look at this passage and see the disciples' uh, response or lack of response and then the people's response and think, like, the disciples, they didn't have faith. They feared they didn't have faith, but the people, they had faith. They, they really believed But the fact of the matter is we get no indication that Jesus was here teaching or that they believed Jesus was who he says he was. But word had spread that Jesus was a miracle worker and that he could heal. And so people were coming all over. They may not have fully understood who Jesus was. They may not have understood everything about it, but they just knew that he could help, that he could heal, and they were running to him and were desperate to him, desperate for him. See, what we see is Jesus, he rescues the disciples, even though they may have lacked some faith. He heals the people, even though they didn't understand who Jesus was. And when we look at these two examples of of Jesus responding to these people, I think as we look at our own lives, we can see this, is that more knowledge doesn't actually make us know Jesus more. More knowledge doesn't necessarily make us know Jesus more. And, and, And do not get me wrong, knowledge is great. Not learning about scripture, learning about God, about Jesus, learning all these things is a wonderful thing to do. We, we, that's why we have Bible studies here at the church. That's why we're doing things like removing the scripture from the screens to promote biblical literacy. It's all, it's a good thing to learn. But if learning doesn't lead to practice, if knowledge doesn't lead to practice, then we are wasting our time. If we just care about learning, if we just care about gaining knowledge, but it doesn't take us to, doesn't lead us to make action, it doesn't lead us any closer to Jesus, then we're missing the whole point. See, that... Camaro that I talked about earlier, it was a wonderful car. It was a great car. Until one day, I brought it into the shop that I was working at to change its oil. Just because we are slow and needed an oil change, so I brought it in to do that. I put it up in the air, I took the drain plug out to change the oil, and what's supposed to come out is a brown or a black oil, but what came out is a delicious looking milkshake white oil. And what that means is that coolants or antifreeze had gotten into the oil, had gotten to the engine, and probably meant that I had a blown head gasket, which means expensive, difficult to fix, car would be out of commission for a while, something that I didn't have the the money to deal with or the time to deal with. But what I did is because I was at work, I put the drain plug back in, filled it up with oil, and I drove it home. 
And if you drove past me on the road, you would have no idea there was anything wrong with it because it rode fine. From the outside, it looked like everything was fine, but in, inside, it was corroding, it was decaying, and it was dying. See, I put a Band-Aid on it, essentially. I did something for the time being, but I didn't get to the heart of the issue. I didn't actually fix what the issue was. See, if your faith is struggling, we have to address the real issue. And it's not just to amass more knowledge or just learn as much as we can, but the, 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 the real issue, or it starts with, the first thing we can do, the first thing we need to do, it just starts with, just like the people did, it's just running to Jesus. Just run to Jesus. It doesn't matter if you don't fully understand everything, if, if you're still learning, if there are difficult passages that you're working through, those are all good things to do and all things you can do in tandem with this, but it also needs to come with just getting to Jesus, just being with him, spending time with him, even in our lack of understanding and in our lack of knowledge. People ran from all over to Jesus, it said, not because they knew everything, not because they had all the knowledge, looked at everything, and decided Jesus was the, 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 the Savior or coming to, to the, the coming Son of God. It's just because they were desperate for him. So they ran, even if they didn't fully understand. See, we can have this tendency, and I've done it many times too, to have a, 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 an issue in our faith or uh, going through a difficult time and just think, I just, I just need to find the right answer. I think, I, I've read this so many times, but I bet I just missed a verse, and if I catch that verse, it'll solve everything. And it, let me tell you, if you've never read the account of Jesus, it does solve a lot to understand who Jesus is. But it's not the only thing. It also comes with having a personal relationship with him, acknowledging the sacrifice he made, being in community with people, growing closer to him alone by yourself and in community and doing everything you can just to get as close to Jesus as possible. The knowledge will come. It'll come little bit by little bit, and it'll never come the full, all the way. But we'll, we'll get there slowly, and slowly, but it has to start with actually being in communion with Jesus. See, if you're new to faith, and it, this, is, this is the case regardless if you're new to faith or if you've been with Jesus for a long time, there's always steps we can take to be closer to him. But if you are newer to faith or if you're unsure what this means, it just starts with being with him. It starts with acknowledging the sacrifice he made for you, even though it was completely undeserved. And acknowledging it and just being with him. And the rest comes. And so I want to take a few moments to pray. And I want to pray for us and pray for me as well. That regardless of where we are in our walk with Jesus, that we will take that step closer to him. That we'll take that step closer to him, acknowledge that even though we don't know everything, that's okay, but we can just be with him. So if you would, let's pray together. Father, we thank you that we don't have to know everything. That you, you, you've given us knowledge and you've given us brains that work to understand so much, which is all wonderful things, but that you don't require us to have a certain amount of knowledge or do a certain amount of things before you'll accept us. God, but that you just say, come. Come to me. And God, that's what I want to do. And that's what I hope we can do as a church, is we can just come. Just come to you. Even in our brokenness, even in our misunderstanding, even in our, in our sinfulness, that we can just come and acknowledge the sacrifice that you made, Jesus that we are so undeserved of, that I personally show every day how much I don't deserve it, but even still, you say, I love you, and just come. Jesus, we thank you. We pray in your name.